myself and Attorney Moran, who is um, sitting with us from our office, assisting in this case. We're in route upstairs. We were on the elevator banks as one of the marshals was uh, bringing two of the alternate jurors back upstairs. When the elevator doors opened, uh, Attorney Moran and myself, when we realized who was inside the elevator, we turned around and immediately walked away. We did not say anything. And the marshal escorting the jurors leaned out and said, thanks, Liz, we love you. And it, uh, the elevator doors closed. So at that point, I immediately came upstairs and formed Attorney Felson and Attorney Showhorn, as well as the marshal's uh, service. And uh, I am bringing that on the record now that that exchange happened. Uh, no one from the state said anything back. In fact, we walked away quickly when we realized who was in the elevator bank. Attorney Felson. Uh, we had Attorney some Schoen. discussion about that. I don't think we need to put a lot on the record. Um, I think it was inadvertent. Um, I understand that uh, the marshals are just going to switch. And um, I think that the only thing that um, maybe the court should do is at least advise the jury that any comments they hear in the hallway or the elevators about anybody connected to the case should be disregarded. And I think that um, that probably would take care of it. I'm not seeking anything more important than that. I'm, I'm certain it was inadvertent. Thank you. <clears throat> First, the court will address the supervising marshal in the courtroom. Uh, no marshal is to comment at any time on the case or any individuals involved in the case or comment on the court. And no marshal is to have any conversation with individuals, specifically counsel and the staff of the state's attorney's office or the uh, staff or counsel uh, for the defense in the presence of any juror. Now, what has happened today is the court agrees with Attorney Schoenhorn inadvertent. Attorney Moran is not conducting any cross-examination or direct examination. She is assisting uh, counsel in the presentation of the exhibits. The court is not convinced that the comment from the marshal will lead the jury to, or those jurors who heard it, to opine about the nature of the state's case or the nature of the defense. If the comments had concern, perhaps, Attorney McGinnis or Attorney Manning and had been of the tenor, we love you, you're doing a great job, keep it up. That's a different story. But as of right now, the court thinks any opinion formed by alternate jurors based on the comment to Attorney Moran is of little effect. But the court will address the jury when they come in. Attorney there is one other matter, Judge, that I need to um, raise at this time. And um, I'm doing it at the earliest moment before the jury uh, comes in. Um, one of the reasons we file our motions in limine is so that issues that are potentially prejudicial and require some deliberation on the court are heard in advance outside the jury's presence. So when uh, the current witness, Ms. Almeida, was on the stand, we were aware of, we had listened to the 911 calls. We were aware of the highly prejudicial 
nature of some of her comments that were clearly hearsay. And I note specifically that we were aware and the state was aware of our concern about the issue of a uh, mention that at some point Mr. Dulos had purchased a firearm, a firearm that he then disposed of years ago as part of a, uh, a divorce case. So when that was said, Your Honor, we tried, uh, Attorney Felsen tried to uh, get this decided so that the witness would be admonished outside the presence of the jury. There are cases such as State versus Onofrio in 179 Connecticut, State versus Gerolamo, G-I-R-O-L-A-M-O in 197 Connecticut, State versus Williams in 182 Connecticut, where those cases say that evidence about guns, where that is where firearms is not a part of the case, is particularly inflammatory and it'll have been, can have an effect on the jury's judgment. Um, it awakens sympathy, passions, and influences the judgment of the jury and cannot be considered harmless. Based on that, Your Honor, and I'm reluctant to do this, but I'm making a motion for mistrial. The motion's denied. The court received a motion in limine this morning. If the defense had indicated in the motion in limine exactly what this witness may say that was prejudicial concerning guns or the purchase of guns, it should have appeared in the motion. That would have alerted the court to the nature of the hearsay. But a general motion in limine to preclude hearsay is not enough for this court to grant a blanket motion without having some road map as to what the highly prejudicial nature of the testimony would be. Your Honor, it had to do with the motion yesterday regarding marital discord. That was where the court would not entertain a proffer about what issues would or would not be allowed in and would hear them as they arose. And that's what I'm referring to more so than the fact that this witness was allowed to testify about her conversations to the police, which is also, I know, testimonial in nature. Well, a general motion in limine about marital discord does not lead to discord considering testimony about a gun. And so um, motion for marital discord generally may involve contention, arguments, physical assaults, but not the purchase of a gun. So the court is not on notice from a motion to preclude testimony about marital discord that there may be evidence of a gun. And again, the motion in limine filed today mentions nothing about a firearm or a purchase of a firearm. So the court has no idea as to what the prejudicial, well, unfairly prejudicial nature of the testimony would be. Bring the jury in. Council stipulate to the presence of all of the jurors. Please. Yes, Judge. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, it was brought to the court's attention that there may have been a number of you, perhaps the court should say, a few of the alternate jurors who may have heard, overheard a comment from one of the marshals who have been assigned to this case. 
And that comment was directed towards uh, Attorney uh, Moran, who is uh, sitting uh, behind counsel table, sitting behind attorneys uh, Manning and McGinnis. And that comment uh, was directed towards her, but it was probably overheard by one or more of the alternate jurors. And that comment was essentially a complimentary comment to Attorney Moran. It was brought to the court's attention that that comment may in some way uh, be perceived as an opinion by one of the marshals as to the strength of the state's case. The court uh, is not convinced that that comment was an endorsement of the strength of the state's case. Nevertheless, what the court will do is indicate to you that if you hear any comment from any of the court staff concerning any other participant in the trial or the nature of the state's case or the nature of the defense case, first, if you overhear it, and you think it needs to be brought to the attention of the court, it should be brought to the attention of the court. Secondly, if you think it probably means very little or has little effect, just ignore it. However, any comment that would suggest that the strength of the state's case or the strength of the defense case is being articulated in your hearing that should be brought to the attention of the court. Thank you. We can bring the witness back, uh, back in. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon again. Hi. Uh, we were talking about the Miami Ski Club, I think, when we were last mm -hmm. here. Um, the Miami Ski Club is a water ski club. Yeah. Uh, and it's members only. Yes. Private. Yes. And uh, FOTUS had a membership there. Yes. Do you know for how long FOTUS had that membership? I'm not exactly sure. Okay. But uh, Fotis had been traveling down to Miami for some time. Yes. Alone. Yes. And with the kids. Yes. Uh, for years. Yeah. And Fotis water skied. Yes. Competitively. Yes. You describe him as very competitive. Yes. And not just in water skiing. With everything. Everything. Uh, had he been water skiing since when you first met him? Yeah. And he taught the kids to water ski? Yeah. And they all water skied? They all water ski, yeah. Some of them competitively? Yes. They had won medals? Yes. Did he teach you to water ski too? He did. All right. And I think he also taught you how to drive the boat? Yep. When you went to uh, the Miami Ski Club in March of 2017, and uh, you met Michelle yes. for the first time. Yes. And um, you met her daughter as well. Her daughter was there. Yes. Uh, Your Honor, I'd move uh, into evidence. Defendants, I, I changed the numbers a little bit. It's I1 through I4, I believe, without the state's objection. That's correct, Judge. The defendants, I1 through 4, they admitted as full exhibits. And can you pull up Bob I-4, please? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Almeida, do you recognize some of the people in this picture? Yes. Is Fotis in this picture? Yes. Is Michelle in this picture? Yes. And um, the Dulos children? 
Not all of them. Okay, but some of the doula's children are in the picture? It looks like two of them. Okay, and do you recognize uh, Michelle's daughter in that picture? Yes. All right. And is that at the Miami Ski Club? I think so. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell. Do, do you remember if you took the picture or not? No, I don't remember. Okay. But you had been at the Miami Ski Club before? Yes. All right. And um, you recognize Fotis and Michelle in this picture? Yes. All right. And to at least two of the, the Dulos children and his, uh, Michelle's daughter? Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Was Michelle at the ski club every time that you were there when you went there in March of 2017? No, I don't think so. All right. How many times did you go there that week? <sighs> to be honest, I don't really remember. But you went frequently? Yeah, the reason for that trip was so that they could water ski. Okay, so you, I'm assuming you went every day. Yeah, we probably went mostly every day. All right, and you were there for lengthy periods of time? Yeah. And Michelle was there several of the times at least? Yeah. All right, and she was interacting with um, Fotis? Yep. And the kids? Yeah. And they seemed familiar with her? Some of the kids. All right. And you observed that. It was in front of you. Yes. It wasn't being done in private or in secret. No. And I, I think you mentioned you spoke to Michelle. Yep. And she told you that she intended to move to Vail, Colorado with her daughter. Yes. Do you know, uh, in fact, whether she did that at any point in time? I don't know. Did Fotis water ski a lot? Yes. All right. Um, did you go with him sometimes down to the pond? With the kids, yes. Okay. There was a pond in Avon, Connecticut? Yeah, in Avon. All right, and he would go down there? Yep. All right, and uh, would you ever go with him when he competed? Yes. All right, and would the kids go with him and with you when he competed? Anytime I went with Fotis, it was always with the kids okay. to watch him compete or the kids compete. Okay. Um, Bob, can you pull up I-1? Do you recognize the people in this picture? Yeah. All right, and is that Fotis? Yes. And is he with one of his children? Yes. Um, was this picture, you did not take this picture, did you? No, but I know where that picture was taken. All right, do you know, can you tell the jury when this picture was taken? Yeah, so we were coming back from a trip, a ski trip. Um, it was around Christmas time, and some of us got on a plane, there was a lot of cancellations and stuff like that and I wanted to be home for Christmas so Jennifer myself and four of the kids were able to get on a different flight because ours got canceled to be back home and there was only enough seats for all the amount of that was there and so there was Fotis and Theodore stayed back and I think it was like maybe a day was it Christmas time of 2015 16 17 18 what year was it to be honest, I don't remember, to be honest. All right, but it was prior to 2019. Prior to 2019. Okay. And um, in this picture, Fotis has a very short hair, correct? Yeah. All right. Had you ever shaved Fotis's hair? No. All right. Um, but, but you do recognize him in this picture? Yes. All right. Um, Bob, can you pull up I-2? This is also a picture of Fotis? Yeah. With one of his children? Yeah. Um, and even though the date's on there, can you tell um, or give a sense to the jury if, in fact, uh, that seems like a picture taken of Fotis and one of his children in 2016? Yeah, it was probably at the pond, it looks like, maybe, and oh. the one in Avon. I don't know. But about that year? Does that yeah. year seem right? The way Petros looks? Yeah. All right. Uh, and, Bob, can you please pull up I-3? Do you recognize Fotis in this picture? Yes. And with his children? Yes. Um, was this also at the pond? I can't really tell. But was this prior to 2019? Yes. Right. Bob, you can take that down. Thank you. You told the jury that you stayed behind in Miami in uh, March of 2017 for a little while? When Jennifer went back home? Yes. Yes. And then you returned uh, 
at some point? Yes. Without FOTUS? Without FOTUS. Uh, and Jennifer told you that she confirmed that FOTUS was having an affair? Yes. And she didn't seem surprised? No. And she said she wasn't in love with him and hadn't been for a long time? Yeah. Jennifer also told you when you were in Florida that she suspected Fotis was having an affair. Yes, she did. And you didn't believe her at first? No. And you had worked with him for several years before? Yes. Side by side? Yep. And you thought you knew him? I thought I knew him. Um, did you know that Fotis had been married before Jennifer? At that time in 2017, yes, but okay. it took me some time to find that out. All right, but you, you eventually learned that? Yes. That he, in fact, was married before? Yes. And he was dating Jennifer while he was still married? I didn't know the details. Okay. Did you learn that at some point? No, I didn't. Okay. okay so uh, before you proceed, uh, counsel, uh, the court has to take a brief recess, not based on anything other than something has been brought to the court's attention. So um, this is not the afternoon recess, ladies and gentlemen. This is just something the court has to address immediately. So we ask that you return to the deliberation room and please do not discuss the case. Everyone needs to leave the courtroom. All rise. This honorable superior court now stands in recess. Please exit the courtroom.
that discussion. Please be seated. Thank you. <clears throat> I think the doors are still locked, Judge. Do we have internet on that thing or not? Yes. I guess we yes. should be. No, you can. I have it in airplane mode right now. Can we switch it back to airplane mode before yep. we're in there? Yeah. No, I figured no. Are we on the record, Madam Monitor? The court indicated before it took that brief recess <clears throat> that it had to address a matter. And the court has to address that matter at this time, which has nothing to do with the merits of the case. The court was informed previously that one of the marshals <clears throat> had in the presence of Two of the jurors uh, rendered a complimentary, uh, complimentary remark uh, to attorney Liz Moran uh, outside of one of the elevator banks. And that complimentary remark was that, uh, according to what was reported to the court, we love you. But the attribution to uh, the marshal was an incorrect attribution. The court has now learned <clears throat> that it was not the marshal who said, uh, we love you to Attorney Moran, but it was one of the jurors. That is cause for the court to have to bring in that juror to determine whether those remarks were made and if those remarks were made, then that juror may have to be dismissed. But first, we will ask uh, Mr. Uh, Christian Alvarado to just take the stand so that we can understand what the nature of those comments were as he heard them. The court should also indicate that when the juror is brought in, there will be no video coverage of that, no still photo coverage of that, and we would ask both the videographer and the photographer to wait outside of the courtroom when that juror is brought in. Madam Clerk. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm as the case may be that the evidence you shall give regarding this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you God or upon penalty of perjury? I do. Just state your name. Christian Alvarado. Thank you. Marshal Alvarado, you may be seated. Marshal Alvarado, the court will just draw your attention to the uh, time before we took, well, we took our lunch and recess and you were in the presence of uh, at least two jurors uh, after the court had recessed. Can you uh, tell the court what happened and what you heard? I was on the elevator coming back from lunch with the two jurors, and it made a stop on the second floor. Um, attorneys uh, Moran and Manning tried to get on the elevator. 
uh, they turned back around. And in the midst of that, I said, uh, thanks, Liz, and the juror ultimately kind of stuck his head out and said, we love you, the door closed, and then we went on our way. Okay. Now, uh, was that juror's comment directed towards Attorney Moran? I believe so, yes. And how many other jurors were present when that comment was made? Other than him, just one more. And was there any other marshal with you when those comments were made? Just me. Was there anyone who was not a marshal or a juror uh, close enough to hear those comments? Not that I could see from my point of view. Okay. Thank you. You may step down. Yes. Now, what the court is going to do at this point is call that juror in. The cameras need to go off. And we ask the videographer and the photographer to step out of the courtroom.
make the record as to what has transpired. It was brought to the court's attention when we began our afternoon session that there were some comments made by what was believed to be a marshal that was heard by some jurors who were sitting on the case. It was later discovered that it was not the marshal that made those comments. It was one of the jurors who made the comment. Now, the comment was directed towards, as the court understands it, uh, at least one person, uh, attorney Elizabeth Moran, who is one of the assistant state's attorneys who was assisting the state in the presentation of exhibits. The comment made by one of the elevator banks in the presence of another juror and one of the marshals, or the marshal uh, that was involved, was that uh, we love you directed at least to Attorney Moran. <clears throat> Upon uh, learning that the comment was made and that it was made by one of the jurors, the court conducted an inquiry calling that juror uh, to uh, the courtroom and having that juror sit in the jury box and the court asked the juror if he made such comments, and the tenor uh, of uh, the response was yes. The comment was directed at both Attorney Moran and Attorney Manning. And the court indicated to the juror that it can easily be perceived that the comment made to at least Attorney Moran can be an endorsement an opinion about the strength of the state's case and that he at this time was favoring the state's case. The court explained to the juror that the appearance that there was a favorable opinion of the state's case indicates to this court at this time that it would be difficult to proceed with him seated as a juror because the impartiality and fairness of that juror can reasonably be questioned. That was juror number 420. The court dismissed the juror. The court then uh, asked that the juror who was in the presence of that juror, who also heard the comments, uh, to uh, be seated in the jury box. The court asked that juror if those comments were discussed with anyone else, that is, anyone on the jury. And the response was no. And the court asked if those comments were heard by anyone other than himself, juror 399, and of course, juror 420, and the response was no. Because the inquiry involved an inquiry of jurors, uh, the court maintained its supervisory authority not to have that portion of the proceeding recorded either by video or by audio, other than the court reporters taking of the audio of the proceeding. Are we ready to proceed? 
Yes, Judge. So we can bring, well, let's bring the jury back in. Well, we can bring the witness in first, and then we'll bring the jury in. May inquire, Attorney Felser. Your Honor, it's I have to wait for the oh, jury. Oh, I'm sorry. Again. Please bring the jury in. <clears throat> Counsel stipulate? Yes, Judge. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Wyatt. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, good afternoon again. We keep getting interrupted. Yes. Apologize. All good. Um, I want to just close something out. And if I had asked you already, and I'm repeating it, I apologize, but maybe I missed it. Um, I think you said at some point in time, um, you did not know that Fotis had been married previously. Uh, did at some point you learn that? I learned it at some point. Okay. Do you remember when you learned that? It was a few years after working for um, Jennifer and Fotis. Okay. Um, it was before 2017? Yes. All right. Um, and did you learn that um, he was still married when he was with Jennifer? I'm just going to no. object, Your Honor. Ask and answer calls for hearsay. Well, the question was, did you, what does the word, the word believe that he was still married? So the court did not catch the phrasing, Attorney Felsen. Would you phrase the question again as you stated it? At some point, did, um, did you learn that Fotis was still married while he was dating Jennifer. Same objection, Judge. Well, did you learn that Fotis was still married while he was dating Jennifer? And the objection is? Well, it's twofold. One is that she's already answered this question, so it's asked and answered. And then my second objection is that it calls for hearsay information. Well. The objection is overruled. Okay, that's fine. Um, no. Okay. Um, <clears throat> After you came back up from Miami and um, Jennifer had told you that she was going to leave, uh, she asked you to uh, go with her? It wasn't right. That it wasn't that night when I got back. No. Okay, but it was shortly after that. Uh, a few weeks after. And you said yes. Yes. And you gave notice to Fotis that you were quitting for group. Yes, I did. But you didn't tell Fotis that um, why you were quitting, right? And the plan was for Jennifer to move out of Fort Jefferson? The plan with myself or the plan with like that? Her Just with photos. Jennifer to move out. She, yeah, her plan was to no longer live at Fort Jefferson. Okay, and to leave without photos knowing that she was going to leave. 
she was going to let him know after she left. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So she was going to leave without him knowing yeah. that she left. And she was going to take the children without him knowing that she was going to take the children. Yes. And she told you not to tell, obviously, Fotis, right? Yep. You had testified to some, uh, there was tension in the house, right? Between, yeah. I would say, when you got back from Miami and then when uh, Jennifer moved out. Yeah, so like the months prior to her leaving. Uh, um, and there was also some tension between you and Fotis, where Fotis had yelled at you. Yes. In 2017. Well, the tension with Fotis and myself didn't really start until after, well, the day I left with Jennifer. Okay. Um, so from about June of 2017, mm -hmm. for at least that month, there was some tension? Uh, probably a few months after that. Uh, and you had testified that you saw him here in court? I did. It was in this courthouse? Yes. And he approached you? He did. And he was angry? Yes. Um, and then his personality shifted, and he um, appeared to be reasonable? Yes. Uh, um, and he also had approached you once at the pond, I think, and had been yelling at you. Yes. And then suddenly switched and became very reasonable. There were several times in which he yelled at me, different okay. occasions of drop-offs. And then his personality just shifted. Yeah. Uh, um, and those were in 2017? Yes. And because of that, uh, you had indicated to Jennifer that you no longer wanted to have contact with Fotis. Yes. So between 2017 um, to 2019, you had very little contact with Fotis. Yes. All right. You didn't go to Fort Jefferson. No. Um, you didn't know who was living at Fort Jefferson. No. Um, you didn't talk to Fotis on the phone. Mm, there might have been a few occasions. They were going to a family systems therapy where I would do some drop-offs, um, but that was more controlled, so occasionally I would do that. But there was never really any like calls or texts between photos. Okay, for, so for two years, other than those few times, you really had no interaction with him? No. So I'm going to fast forward now to, mm -hmm. um, to 2019 to May of 2019, you were still working for Jennifer? Yeah. And um, Jennifer was living in New Canaan? Yes. <coughs> At some point, uh, she moved to 69 Wells? Yeah, she originally moved to 153 Chichester, which was in New Canaan. And I think it was a year she moved to 69 Wells Lane. And when she was at 69 uh, Wells, you were working, doing child care? Yes. And you were helping organize the house? Yes. In May of 2019, was, uh, were the Dulos kids and Jennifer living at 69 Wells? Yes. And in May of 2019, did FOTUS have supervised visitation with the children? Supervised, yes. And that was on Wednesdays? Wednesdays, and if it was agreed upon other days, for like that Memorial Day weekend, he was supposed to have a visit on Saturday, but that's because it was agreed on before. So okay. there was some flexibility if the supervisor and Jennifer, they all agreed. All right. And you're talking about the Saturday of Memorial Day weekend? Yes. All right. So the Wednesday before it, let's go to the Wednesday before it. That was May 22nd? Yep. And did FOTUS have scheduled visitation uh, with the kids on that Wednesday? Yes. And it was through um, a court-ordered supervisor? Yes. And that court-ordered supervisor would be present when FOTUS met with the children? Yes. And spent time with them. Um, and that had been happening for many weeks prior. Yes. That Wednesday, May 22nd, um, FOTUS had a supervised visitation with the kids? Yes. And it ended up being at 69 Wells? Not the whole visit. Okay, but part of it was at 69 Wells? Part of it. And. Um, Jennifer had agreed to your understanding to allow him to be on uh, outside in the backyard at 69 Wells? Yes. All right. Um, you didn't want to be there? No. Right. And you weren't there while Fotis was there? No. 
So you didn't see Fotis interact with the kids that night? No. And you didn't see Fotis interact with the supervisor that night? No. And you didn't see Fotis interact with Jennifer that night? No. So that's Wednesday, May 22nd. Thursday, May 23rd, you worked a regular schedule? Yes. Um, you were in the house? Yes. And I think you had mentioned that um, that Thursday you had emptied out paper towels into the pantry? Yeah, the evening before I left that okay. Thursday. And there were several of them? Twelve. Okay. There's a package of twelve? Yeah, it was the big packs. Is there more than one pantry in the kitchen or is there just one main pantry? One main pantry. And is that the pantry where um, food is also stored? Yes. And the kids' water bottles? Yep. And there's no other pantry, just that one? There's like cabinets and stuff, but the food pantry was just that pantry, yeah. Okay, and the paper towels went in that pantry? Yep. All right. Now, May 24th is that Friday before Memorial Day. Um, you had indicated that FOTUS had scheduled visitation with the kids for that weekend? That Saturday. Okay, did he also have it for Sunday? I don't remember. All right. And that would have been through the courts? Yes. By agreement? Yes. That Friday, you got to 69 Wells at about, did you say 11 a.m.? Yeah, around there. I don't know exact time. And you didn't expect Jennifer to be home? No. Because she had plans to be in New York? Yep. And you understood that she had doctor's appointments in New York? Yes. And you were going to meet her in New York later in the afternoon? Yes, I was going to meet her at her mom's. After you picked the kids up from school? Yes. That Friday, they had a half day? They had a half day. Because of the Memorial Day weekend? I think so. I don't really know. And you went to the house before you picked up the kids? Yes. I think you testified that um, you went in through the garage? Yes. Through the middle bay of the garage? Yes. Do you remember when you got there um, that there are three garage bays? Yep. All three of them are closed? Yes. And you remember that? Yes. And you used the keypad to get in that, yes. that morning? Uh, and that keypad is only for the middle bay? Yes. All right. and, and when you opened it, you saw that the, the Range Rover was parked in the middle bay? Yes. And that was not what you were expecting? Yes. Because uh, you had expected that Jennifer was going to take the Suburban? No, she, she was going to take the Range Rover, and okay. the Suburban was going to be left. Okay. So you saw the Range Rover there, and, and that wasn't what you expected, because you expected that that would have um, been gone by that time of the day. Yes. Normally... Um, so there's three bays, and the, the Range Rover was in the middle bay. Yes. Does uh, Jennifer park the Suburban in the left bay? Yes, on the left side. Okay, she, she always does that. That's just, just what always, she does? Yeah. Um, even if she's running in for five minutes. Yeah, it's always that, always that one. All right. It was impossible to park in the other one because of the other stuff that was in that bay. It wouldn't have fit through the third bay. The, the kids' stuff? The kids' that, stuff. Got yeah. it. And you had indicated when you walked through the garage that first time when you were walking through, um, you were going inside, were you going inside just to straighten up before you picked the kids up? Yeah, I had the sandwiches with me, so I put them in the fridge. And then, yeah, I usually go before I pick up the kids to straighten up. And you didn't notice anything unusual in the garage when you first went through? Other than the Range Rover being there, no. You weren't really looking for anything. I wasn't looking, no. yeah. Did you go, um, when you walked in, did you go to the right of the Range Rover or to the left, if you remember, to get up to the, the, the garage door leading into the kitchen or the mudroom? Yeah, so I always go to the right because usually the suburban's there, so it's kind of just habit to go on the side that's empty Got that it. leads through the door into the mudroom. And that door was unlocked? Yes. And it's usually unlocked? Yes. So that wasn't unusual? No, that wasn't unusual. So when you went inside, you had uh, said that you saw... Jennifer's purse in the, in the house on the floor? It was in the doorway between the mudroom and the kitchen. 
And usually she has it on the counter where she takes it with her? Yes. So that was, it was on the floor and that was an unusual thing? Yes. But you didn't go through it at the time? No, I didn't go through it. Did Jennifer usually bring her purse with her when she was traveling? <coughs> traveling like to New York? Traveling in general? Yeah. It depended, like she would, she would take her wallet and phone sometimes, it's just she would leave her bag somewhere else. It, would, it just wouldn't really be on the floor. So that was unusual. Having the bag on the floor was unusual, yeah. And you saw um, when you walked in, there was an uneaten granola bar on the counter? Yeah, it was like still in its packaging. All right, you put that away? Yes. And then there was a mug of tea? Yes. And it was full? Yep. You washed that mug? Yep. The mug wasn't, the tea wasn't hot. It was semi-warm. It was semi-warm. And about what time was that? Like close to 11. All right. After you washed the mug, you noticed that you needed, there were no more paper towel rolls? Yes. So you went and replaced those, um, that roll of paper towels. I just went to go get a new one in the pantry. Do you recall there being a, a paper towel holder on the island in the kitchen? Yes, it was right next to the sink. And is that what you did? You replaced the roll that was on there, the used up roll, and replaced it with a new roll? Yes. And then you left to pick up the kits? Yes. You went back through the garage? Yeah, I went through the mudroom, out the middle bay, closed the door, and got in my car to get the other kids. And then you picked up four of the kids? Yep. And brought them back? I brought the four back to the house. The four kids, you went back through the garage? Yes, we always went through the garage. When you left to pick the kids up, did you shut the garage door? Yes. And then you entered again, you entered the keypad? Yes. And you went back in? Yes. Do you recall if the four children went to the right of the Range Rover and um, walked into the house that way with you? I don't recall. I but don't all five of you um, from school went back into the house? Yes. And you didn't, there was nothing unusual at that point in the garage? Uh, no, we just went right into the mudroom. Got it. And again, you weren't looking for anything at that point? Yeah, that's correct. At some point, did you notice that there's, a, I guess, another mudroom door leading to the outside? Yes. Did you notice that that door was unlocked? Yes. That's unusual, right? That was unusual, yes. It's usually locked? <clears throat> it's usually locked. Especially that time of day? Yes. The only time it was unlocked was when the kids were playing outside because it was right directly towards the backyard. But other than that, that door was always locked. So you eat lunch there? Yes. Um, and then you brought the kids to New York? Yes. Everybody went back through the garage? Yep. All, it, so it was the five of you went back yeah, through the garage? And myself and four of the kids. And then did you shut the garage door when you left? Yes. At some point during the, the evening, you became very concerned, and you called the police. I did. Uh, and you were giving them information, um, not just then, but over the next couple of days, you were talking to them and cooperating with them. Yes. Um, during that time, when you were talking to the police, Fotis was reaching out to you. He was texting you. Yes. Um, can you uh, pull up States 12? 16. 16. That's it. Um, is that the first page of it? Can you go to the next page? This is, that's not what it is. I think it's, may I have one moment, please? Okay. 
So it will be two within that disk. These are your communications with Fotis, right? Yes. He was reaching out to you while you were talking to the police? Yes. Um, and is this the first time he communicated with you? I can't see on top what time it says. Uh, the first, he, no. I had a phone call with him before that. Okay. Um, Bob, can you scroll down? Keep scrolling. Keep scrolling. Maybe the next page. Okay. Um, can you see where it says, good morning, GM, Lauren, any news? Yep. All right. And you had said to him, called them at 2.30 and 5.30, uh, no news. They just told me they're still searching. Yes. And, and then Fotis texted to you, I spoke to an officer at, at 1 a.m. as well. Um, what did you take that text to mean from Fotis? The, I spoke to an officer at 1 a.m. as well. Um, I read it as he called them, as I did, to speak to them. Um, and you spoke to the police um, and told them that you were talking to Fotis, or communicating with Fotis, right? Yes. And um, did you learn that Fotis, in fact, was not cooperating with the police afterwards? No. You did not learn that? Learn, can you repeat that? Did you, it was poorly worded. Did, did you learn that Fotis, in fact, was not cooperating with the police? At that moment? After. After that moment? Yes. And days, yeah, we learned that he was not cooperating. Okay, even though Fotis told you he spoke with an officer? Yes. All right, thank you. He was also texting you on Sunday because uh, it sounds like he was asking you how things were doing. Yes. And he actually showed up in New York. He did. Um, he drove down in his car. Yeah, he drove, I believe, in his Suburban. Um, and that was where the children were staying? Yes. You were there? I was there. And it was an apartment? Yes. There's a bellman downstairs? Yep. Did he demand to see the children? Yes. Saying they were abducted? Yes. <clears throat> You'd said that um, Fotis water skied a lot. He did. Very competitively. Yeah. But that he was competitive with everything. Yeah. Um, he was also a runner. You've seen him run before. Yeah. One moment, please. Fair redirect. Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Ms. Almeida, you were asked some questions on cross examination regarding Mr. Bulos's travels. Do you recall those? Yes. And I believe you were asked whether or not you understood what he was away for, whether it was vacation or business. Do you recall that question? Yes. Now, in the time that you worked for Four Group, you indicated that you had an opportunity to work on different projects for the company, is that correct? Yes. What states did Four Group develop houses in? Connecticut, and I knew that they built a house in Rhode Island. A singular house in Rhode Island? Yes. You were asked um, some questions about the Miami Ski Club on cross-examination. Do you recall that? Yes. When did you first meet the defendant, Michelle Traconis? It was at the ski club um, I, shortly after we got to Miami. I don't remember the exact day. In March of 2017? Yes, March of 2017. May I um, ask the defense call up defense I? Okay. 
that's a short video in this one. Um, Ms. Almeida, do you recall being asked on cross-examination whether or not you took that photograph? Yes. I just direct your attention to the date, October 17th, 2016. Assuming that that date and time was attributed to that photograph, could you have taken that photograph? No. Thank you, sir. You were asked on cross-examination whether or not the defendant had moved to Vail, Colorado. Do you recall that question? Yes. Where did the defendant move? Farmington, Connecticut. Where in Farmington, Connecticut did the defendant move? Fort Jefferson Crossing. How long after Jennifer moved out of the house did the defendant move into Fort Jefferson Crossing? From what I was aware, a few months after. Oh, ground. Basis of knowledge. No foundation. Well, counsel. Well, I think it's fair follow-up to the cross-examination, Judge. Well, the response, as the court understood the response, is from what she understands. And so the court does not know the fount of that understanding. And so the court is going to sustain the objection. How did you become aware that the defendant had moved into Fort Jefferson Crossing? Uh, Jennifer hired a private investigator and had pictures. And when was that? I don't know the exact time. Approximately. It was like a few months, maybe six, up to six months after the divorce started. I just wanted to clarify, you were asked on cross-examination whether or not you'd ever been on vacation alone with Mr. Dulos. Do you recall that question? Yes. Have you ever been on vacation alone with Mr. Dulos? With the kids, never myself and Fotis. Right, and that's what I'm getting at. There were never just the two of you, correct? No. And you were asked some questions on cross-examination regarding Mr. Dulos's arrival in New York on Sunday, May 26th. Do you recall that? Yes. Could you just indicate to the jury what he was claiming? He was claiming that he kidnapped his kids and that he was demanding the bellman to let him up to get his kids, uh, which we already instructed the bellman not to let him up because at that point in time, he didn't have custody of the kids. If I could just have a moment, Judge. I'm sorry, if I could just have one moment. Yes. Did the Dulos children ever reside with their father after May 24th, 2019? No. <clears throat> Was there a scheduled visit for Sunday, May 26th, 2019? I'm not sure. Thank you. Nothing Just one further. moment, please, Your Honor.
State intend to call another witness? Yes, Judge. Just um, before we do, may we have approach with a brief sidebar? Yes. out in patrol uh, where I worked various shifts uh, from there uh, I was a member of the special response team for about 10 years um, and then in about 2016 I was assigned to the investigation section and when you say special response team what's that uh, special weapons and tactics it's a uh, it, it's a team that's comprised for uh, various uh, events that could occur, uh, barricade subjects, you receive special training uh, in tactics and, and weapons use. And the investigations division, what, what type of cases do you work on? Uh, investigations handles any um, involved investigation, uh, burglaries, um, bank robberies, uh, death investigations, any any investigation that will be uh, of like a prolonged time that patrol typically wouldn't uh, have the time to handle it'll get assigned to the uh, investigation section and how long had you been working in investigations prior to may 24th 2019 i was assigned in um, october of 2016. were you working on may 24th 2019 i was and specifically the evening hours, I'll just call your attention to approximately seven or eight o'clock in the evening. Were you working a normal shift at that time? I was not working my normal shift. Okay, so um, I guess I'll ask the question, how did you end up becoming involved in this case? Yes, so, so I had worked my normal shift, which was uh, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. During, during the Friday, um, and I was the on-call investigator. So I was contacted by Lieutenant uh, Ogrens at about uh, 8, 8 p.m. that evening in regards to a, a missing persons report. And um, 
Were you initially, on behalf of the New Canaan Police Department, I guess the lead investigator? Initially, yes. So when you received the uh, call from the lieutenant, what was the next step that you took? Lieutenant Ogrens contacted me initially uh, to request if I could uh, do a search of our license plate readers. I had access to that at the time um, to search for the, um, the um, license plate of the missing person's um, vehicle. Um, so I started to do that and then was contacted a short time later uh, to report that they had located the vehicle on Lapham Road and then they requested <coughs> my assistance. And who was the missing person? Jennifer Dulos. After learning that the vehicle had been located on Lapham Road, what did you do next? I then responded to police headquarters, uh, obtained uh, my gear, and then uh, went to where the vehicle was located on Lapham Road. Prior to responding to Lapham Road from police headquarters, did you request any assistance from any other detectives? Yes, I requested assistance from um, Detective Sergeant Romano, who was newly um, assigned to the Detective Bureau. And um, part of the training process was he would get called out along with any of the on-call investigators. So I had uh, called um, Detective Sergeant Romano to, uh, to come in to assist. And did he respond to Lapham Road separately from you or together? Yes, he did. When you arrived at Lapham Road, what did you see? Uh, I met with Officer Blank, and there was uh, Jennifer's uh, black Chevy Suburban that was uh, parked on the side of the road. And at the time of your um, arrival <coughs> on Lapham Road, was there an active search of Waveney Park going on? Yes. Um, at that point, a canine from Wilton had uh, been there to do a, an initial search of the area. And Waveney Park, what type of park is that? Waveney Park is a approximately 300 acre um, park in New Canaan that's comprised of various uh, open spaces, sporting fields. Um, there's a, what we call Waveney Castle, which is utilized for various events. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a large open area for uh, the townspeople to, to utilize. And um, approximately how long were you at Lapham Road for? Uh, approximately 10 minutes. Did there come a point in time where you responded to 69 Wells Lane? Yes, I did. Approximately what time did you respond to 69 Wells Lane? Uh, that was about 8.10, 10.10 uh, 10, 10, uh, in, in the evening, 10.10 10 p.m. Um, and when you arrived at 69 Wells Lane, how did you approach the home? Uh, so I was informed by uh, Lieutenant Latourette of, of some um, suspected blood that they had observed on a vehicle in the garage. Uh, so I, I met uh, with Lieutenant Latourette at 69 Wells in the driveway. And you're referring to him as Lieutenant Latourette. In fact, he was a sergeant at the time, correct? That is correct, yes. I apologize. Other than um, Lieutenant Latourette and Sergeant Latourette, um, was anyone else present at 69 Wells? At that time, no. What did you do once you arrived? Um, Sergeant Latourette at the time, he had um, directed me into the garage. It was a three bay garage with a, um, a vehicle in the, in the center bay. Uh, and he pointed out the, um, you know, what he had observed to be possible blood evidence on the, uh, on the vehicle. And did you observe it as well? I did. Could you describe it for the jury? So I, I had uh, brought with me a large um, lantern spotlight and when, um, when I utilized that to light up, to illuminate the side of the, of the vehicle, um, you, you could see signs of wiping um, of, of uh, like uh, a car that had been dirty but then had been wiped. Um, as we walked around, noticed, uh, you know, droplets of a, of a red color um, on the side and on the front. Lieutenant McGinnis, just for clarity, could you inquire as to which vehicle this we're this was? About? Sorry. Yes, sir. Um, which vehicle are we? Referring this, there to? was a Land Rover that was parked in the center bay of the uh, 69 Wells garage. Thank you. 
after observing the blood-like objects and the car, the vehicle, what did you do next? So we continued to walk around the interior of the garage where we located some more blood, suspected blood evidence. Um, and it was at that point then that we stepped out of the garage and made the decision to secure the home. Where did you see the additional blood evidence? Um, as we walked around the, the, the word blood, I think it's suspected. Thank you, Will. There's an objection sustained. Where did you see the um, additional blood-like evidence? Um, there was a um, what appeared to be a uh, partial um, shoe impression on the concrete floor. Um, there were two garbage cans inside the garage that, uh, upon further inspection, the, the left-hand uh, portion of the lid had um, suspected uh, blood on that. Um, that, that. Those blood droplets had a texture to them that was consistent to a texture that you would see on a, like a kitchen rubber glove. Um, there was a um, suspected blood droplet on the rear, the driver's side rear of the Land Rover. Um, and then some areas on the concrete floor that appeared to have been uh, blood evidence, uh, suspected blood evidence that was uh, had been wiped up, cleaned up. You, you mentioned the, the garbage can, I believe. Did you, yes. did you ever open either of those? I did. I opened up both garbage cans and did, did a, a cursory look on the inside, mm -hmm. and there were uh, white, typical um, household garbage, um, can, uh, garbage bags that were in uh, either one. Now, after your observations, was the decision made to apply for a search warrant? Yes. Um, at that point, we, we stepped out, we secured, um, we consulted with our supervisors at the time, um, and, and I had um, made the decision that the um, Connecticut State Police major crime should be contacted for us to assist in uh, processing the scene. And the state police, they will routinely assist police departments like New Canaan with processing crime scenes if requested, correct? That is correct. They have the resources, the manpower, uh, and the, the knowledge and experience to do that. And in New Canaan, you all work with the Western District, is that correct? That's correct. Now, um, as you were awaiting state police arrival, where were you? We were uh, in the driveway. Was anyone allowed in the home? No. Approximately what time did the state police arrive? Um, approximately uh, between, I would say, the hours of um, 1 a.m. to 2.30 a.m. And um, did someone from the state police named Sergeant Al Bisson arrive? That's correct, yes. And what was Sergeant Bisson's role with the state police? Sergeant Your Bisson... Honor, I'm going to object. It's cumulative, and this witness is only, would only know from... You're saying what another person's role from a different department was. Well, the question is, what was Sergeant Bisson's role with the state police? No, that's not the same as what did Sergeant Bisson do. So it's sustained. Did you, did you speak with Sergeant Bisson? Yes, I did. And um, did Sergeant Bisson, on behalf of the state police, make any offers to you? He did. He, Sergeant Bisson was the supervisor of the um, Western District Major Crime Ban at the time, and um, he had offered his services and also offered um, if I needed any other uh, investigators or detectives for, for assistance. And when he's offering any other investigators and detectives, he's offering state police personnel, correct? That's correct, yes. Um, after he uh, offered you this additional assistance, uh, did you ultimately accept it? Yes, I did. And so um, as the uh, night continued, mm -hmm. um, the state police are arriving. Yes. Um, did you begin to um, receive information about a potential person of interest in the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos? Yes, we had. And who was that potential person of interest? That was uh, Fotis Dulos, her husband. And um, who informed you of this information? That was from the initial invest, um, initial officers that had taken the um, the missing persons complaint, uh, Officer Kelly Coughlin. And was Officer Coughlin working dispatch that night? That's correct. Yes. 
meaning that she's actually receiving 911 calls and things of that nature? Yes. And um, did you end up speaking with Mr. Dulos that night? Um, not that evening. I spoke with Mr. Dulos the following morning. Uh, Sergeant uh, Ferenga had spoken with Fotis Dulos that evening. Now I want to uh, direct your attention to the following morning. Um, was there a command post set up at the New Canaan Police Department? Yes, there was. And what floor of the New Canaan Police Department was that located on? The second floor in, in the investigations office. And um, who was present at the command post in the early morning hours of May 25th? Uh, myself, um, Sar New Canaan Sergeant Condos, New Canaan Sergeant Romano, New Canaan Sergeant Ferenga, um, Sergeant uh, Al Bisson with Connecticut State Police. Um, there was also um, Detective uh, Chris Allegro, uh, as well as um, several other um, Connecticut State Police uh, detectives. And Detective Allegro, what unit of the State Police was he with? Western District. Was he with the Dan or Major Crime? Major Crime. Major Crime Detective. Now, at some point on the morning of Saturday, May 25th, did you make contact with Mr. Dulos? Yes, I did. How did you make contact with Mr. Dulos? I had uh, made a call to his cell phone. Do you recall how you got his phone number? That was uh, delivered to me from previous um, um, coworkers that had, uh, had already spoken with him. And um, did you make any requests of Mr. Dulos during that call? I had asked if he would be willing to come down to the New Canaan Police Department to, to speak. And did he agree to do so? Yes, he did. Did the two of you agree on a time? Not a specific time. Um, Fotis had stated that he was in a meeting um, and that it would take him uh, approximately an hour and a half to travel from Farmington to New Canaan. And from the moment that you were speaking to him, what would have been an hour and a half? So that was at approximately 9.30 a.m. in the morning. So 11, 11. He would have arrived 11. at approximately 11 had he left? Had he left at that time, yes. Did, um, <clears throat> Was it your intention to interview Mr. Dulos um, with any other detectives? Uh, yes, Which Detective um, Chris Allegro from Connecticut State Police Major Crime. And did Mr. Dulos arrive at 11 a.m.? No, he did not. Direct your attention now to approximately uh, 1230. Were you contacted by anyone on Mr. Dulos's behalf? Yes, so at approximately 1230, um, I had noticed that I had a missed call on my uh, work uh, telephone. Um, and then I had also received an email from uh, an attorney um, associated with photos. And what was the attorney's name? Uh, Jacob Prytanker. Prytranker? Prytranker. And were arrangements made with Mr. Prytranker um, for Mr. Dulos and he to come to the police department? Yes. And did he indicate that he'd be accompanying Mr. Yes, Dulos? Yes, he did. Um, was there an agreed upon time that they would arrive? Um, just that they would be down possibly around um, 2, 2.30 p.m. Now I want to um, direct your attention now to approximately 2.40 in the afternoon. Um, did you receive any um, notifications from the New Canaan Police Department front desk? Yes. So um, the, the dispatcher at the time had uh, contacted, they called my desk to uh, inform me that there were two persons in the uh, lobby to, uh, that were looking for me. And um, did you go to the lobby? Yes, I did. Who, if anyone, did you go to the lobby with? With uh, Detective Allegro. And when you entered the lobby, who did you see? Uh, photos Dulos. Could you um, describe Mr. Dulos's physical appearance for the jury? Um, yes, he was uh, dressed um, dark colored pants, shirt, um, 
you know, a, a sport uh, blazer he was wearing. And did um, you, Detective Allegro, and Mr. Dulos exchange pleasantries? Yes, yep. we in introduced ourselves. Was Mr. Prytranker in the lobby at the time that you exchanged No, he was not. Where was Mr. Prytranker? Uh, we had asked uh, uh, Mr. Dulos if his attorney was with him and he had motioned to uh, outside of the police department and um, there was an individual outside uh, pacing back and forth on a um, cell phone and he had motioned that that was his attorney. <clears throat> when you say he's outside, did the lobby of the New Canaan Police Department have windows or? Yes, there's windows and there's the, the door is, is glass so you can see outside to the, uh, to the parking lot. And how is Mr. Prytranker dressed? Um, you know, professional, um, suit. Now, um, did Mr. Dulos offer to go get Mr. Prytranker? So he, he stepped outside to go, uh, to go get him and uh, he returned back into the, um, into the lobby um, again without um, the attorney. And was there any conversation at that point about the police department being a secure area? So I had informed uh, Mr. Dulos that the, um, <coughs> we would be going to uh, sit down to talk He's in a secured area, and that I would just need to ensure that he didn't have any um, weapons or anything on him. Um, to which, at that point, he removed his wallet and keys and started to um, search for his phone. And as he was searching for his phone, did he say anything? Uh, just he was initially looking for his phone, didn't know where it was. Um, now, uh, after Mr. Dulos was looking for his phone, did Mr. Prytranker enter the lobby? Yes, he did. And what happened next? Uh, as he entered the lobby, um, Mr. Dulos had seen that he was holding his phone, and he goes, oh, there's my phone. And um, Attorney Prytranker um, had handed it over to uh, Mr. Dulos. And this occurred in your presence? Yes, it did. What happened next? Um, at that point, uh, Attorney uh, Pai Tranker had informed us that um, Mr. Dulos would not be uh, meeting with us at that point. And so um, after Mr. Pai Tranker indicated that Mr. Dulos would not be meeting with you, what happened next? Um, as Mr. Dulos was going to put his phone into his blazer, uh, Detective Allegro asked Mr. Dulos if uh, he could see his uh, phone. And did Mr. Dulos um, give Mr. or Detective Allegro his phone? Yes, he did. What happened next? Um, at that point, Detective Allegro observed that the phone has, um, was secured, was, was locked with the nu um, numerical uh, code, and he asked Mr. Dulos uh, for his uh, passcode. And did Mr. Dulos provide the passcode? Yes, he did. Did Detective Allegro um, use the passcode to get into the phone? Yes, he did. And after he used the passcode to get into the phone, what did he do next? He then placed it into airplane mode and informed that uh, the phone was being seized. Now, in your experience as a detective, um, are cell phones um, sometimes seized in criminal cases? Yes. Objection. Well, in your experience as a detective, are cell phones sometimes seized? Well, that question, to use a colloquial phrase, is loaded, sustained. What types of evidence um, from an investigative perspective can be found on cell phones? Uh, location data, um, phone calls, text messages, emails, pictures. And when you say location data, what do you mean by that? Uh, Any time that uh, a, a cell phone is, is used, um, it will record through metadata where um, the, the, the location that that incident had taken place. There's, there's various apps also that do the same. They will track your, your location to either you know, for, for map guidance or, or whatnot. Did you have a search warrant for the cellular phone at that time? At that time, no. Was one being drafted for the cellular phone? Yes, there was. 
why was the phone seized without a search warrant? Uh, Your Honor, I'm going to object to his subjective reason. You can get into the constitutional issue, but that's, I don't think that's appropriate here. So I'm objecting on relevance grounds. Well, <clears throat> the short answer is going to be so that we could try to find what we want to try to find. That's the answer. The court's going to allow the question. You can answer. Can you just repeat the question? I can try. Um, why was the cell phone seized without a search warrant? To prevent the loss of any uh, possible evidence that was on the phone. Um, after Detective Allegro indicated that the cell phone was seized, did Attorney Freitranker say anything? Yes. What did he say? Uh, he had um, he had stated, you know, why are you why are you taking the phone? Um, on what grounds? Um, and uh, asked if we had a search warrant. And did Detective Allegro explain to him why the phone was being seized? Yes. At that point, um, did uh, Mr. Freitranker and Mr. Dulos exit the police department? Yes, they did. And when they exited the police department, where did they go? Out, outside, right out in front of the, um, the main lobby doors. Were the two of them still visible to you? Yes. And at some point, did Mr. Freitranker uh, come back inside the police department? Yes, he did. And um, did he demand the phone back? Yes, he did. And did Detective Allegro indicate that he was not going to be getting the phone back? Correct. Did uh, Detective Allegro subsequently turn the phone over to you? Yes, he did. And what did you do with the phone? Uh, at that point, ensured that it was in airplane mode and then um, obtained the serial number and the IMEI number for, um, for records. And did you also um, log the phone into evidence? Yes. I have this marked for, I believe it could be a full exhibit. What's the number, please? I think we're, we're up to 17, Judge. State 17, admitted, no objection, full exhibit. Just have a moment, Mr. McGinnis. <clears throat> um, Detective Patton, I've handed you what's been entered into evidence as State's Exhibit 17. Do you recognize State's Exhibit 17? Yes, I do. What is State's Exhibit 17? This is the um, cell phone that was uh, um, seized from uh, Mr. Dulos in the lobby of the King Police Department. And I'm just going to ask if you could just please take the cell phone out and hold it up for the jury. And what type of cellular phone is that? This is an Apple iPhone. Do you know the model? X. You can put it back. And is this the uh, cellular phone that was uh, taken off of Mr. Mr. Dulos sure. or taken from Mr. Dulos? Was a search warrant subsequently sought for Mr. Dulos' uh, cellular phone? That is correct, yes. And um, how does uh, law enforcement 
get information off of a cell phone? In other words, do you guys do a visual inspection of the phone? Do you guys do a download of the phone? What's that look like? No, it's, it's done through a, um, a um, forensic uh, digital examiner. Um, that would do. Uh, that would conduct a, uh, a download um, of the uh, cell phone. And do you know a forensic examiner by the name of Michael Clark? Yes, I do. Um, is Michael Clark affiliated with any police departments here in Connecticut? He's a detective with the Fairfield Police Department. Did you take this uh, cellular phone that's been entered into evidence as State's Exhibit 17 to Michael Clark? I did. Why did you take it to Detective Clark? Uh, Detective Clark had um, forensic software and hardware that was available, um, and he was also available uh, to process on um, Sunday, 26. So you took it to him on Sunday, the next day? Correct, the next day. And um, were you present for Detective Clark's um, download or extraction of the cellular phone? I was. And um, as the uh, phone was being downloaded, were you able to see some of the information that was being downloaded? So yes, after the extraction was complete and was uploaded into the uh, software that then parses the data so that you can see the data, um, you're, you're, you were then able to begin to look at um, some of the data that was, that was being parsed. And I want to direct your attention now specifically to location data. Was there location data that was parsed that you were able to view? That's correct, yes. And um, can you uh, just explain to the jury um, the location data that, that you observed that was of interest to you? Uh, so sir, I'm going to object. Uh, there's going to be, I assume, information concerning that. This is not only hearsay, but it's violation of the best evidence rule to have him testify as to what he saw on an extraction from a phone. Well. The testimony so far is that the cell phone was taken to Detective Clark, who forensically downloaded it. And this detective observed location data. And the question now is what essentially else was observed that was of interest? No, what of the location data was of interest? Right. In other words, parsing from what was actually the download, not something else. Well, there has to be a foundation that Detective Patton can read extracted data from a cell phone. It's not written out in narrative paragraph form, so there has to be a foundation for that. Detective Patton. Um, so the objection, as it is, is sustained. Yes, Judge. Detective Patton, when you are, um, when a phone is, is being downloaded, um, can you just explain to the members of the jury um, what the data looks like? So when it's parsed into the software, it's grouped into categories so that you can easily search, uh, such as pictures will be grouped into the picture category, location data will be grouped into location data, text messages will be grouped into text messages. Um, so you can uh, easily navigate through the information that was retrieved from the phone. And what software allows that to be done? This was Celebrite. And Celebrite is a software company that um, has created a, a mechanism to download cellular phones? Correct. And so when you were reviewing the location data, what type of data were you looking at? We were focused on the date of interest as when um, Jennifer Dulles was reported missing. How does the location data come up on the cellular phone? What does it's, it appear as? It's sorted by date and time. And but the, I guess what I'm getting at is the location data itself. Is it latitude, longitude? Latitude and longitude, and then the software will also give you a um, a map. When you say the software gives you a map, you mean it actually pinpoints where the cellular phone is at a particular time? Correct, and it's displayed on a, um, a map similar to what you would see on like Google Maps on a, on a phone. It shows you an actual, um, you know, not a satellite image, but a default uh, image of a map of the location. So was there any location data of interest to you that you observed on the phone? <coughs> Your Honor, if this is just a yes or no, I don't object. It's the next question. So 
The witness may answer that. <coughs> was there any um, location data of interest that you observed on the phone? Yes. What was that location data? Jackson Ground. Hearsay foundation. Uh, not the. This is not the witness who can testify to that, and it's not the best evidence. It's my understanding if they have this data, they can produce it. But this witness simply can't say any more than you or I can say. Oh well, the computer produced this, and now I see certain things. So I object on that basis. Well, the court's view is this: if the witness has testified that what is seen is a date and a map, then the witness can testify what he saw on the map. That is the witness's personal knowledge as to what he saw on the map. So overruled. You may answer the question. So we observed that there was a, uh, a route that was taken to um, Albany Avenue in Hartford uh, on the evening of uh, May 24th. And do you recall approximately what time that route was taken? Approximately 7 p.m. Where had the phone been in the morning, according to the, what you observed? Uh, could I just have a running objection to all of this? Yes, well, again, the court, the court thinks the objection is well taken. If there's a map, then that map is either a point in time or it's a map where you're looking at the course of a route over an extended period of time. So the question, what else suggests to this court that what this officer observed is not simply a point in time on the map. So there has to be a foundation as to how he would determine where the device had been hours earlier. How did you determine where the device had been hours earlier? Through the location data of the phone. And so can you just explain to the members of the jury how you're able to do that? Well, again, I'm going to object. He testified he didn't do it, and it's not even his program. So I think this is the wrong record, the wrong witness for that aspect of it. I certainly didn't object to the general explanation of what he brought and saw someone do. But now for asking him to interpret the data is where I object. I couldn't cross-examine this witness about specifics without actually having those documents through the witness who produced them. I may not require that person. I'm just saying I don't think he's the right person. Right. Well, uh, it would appear that the question and the question the court would have is, how does this mapping of a device work such that you can follow it over the course of a number of hours? Try to ask the judge's question. Um, how, how does the mapping uh, work so that you can follow it over a number of hours? I'm not an expert witness in the behind the scenes of how the software was developed and how they gather the information to then present it. Um, but my understanding is well, that... then I'm going to object to his then lay understanding. Well, then the question is, how do you come to the conclusion as to Albany Avenue other than... Well, the court does not even know what the answer is to other than... How did you come to the conclusion that the device was on Albany Avenue based on the forensic download? You can answer that question. Because the, the, the phone captures location data when it's being utilized, and then the software will parse that and easily show the location data in a chronological order, and you can follow that through and tab through each location and it will then update you and show you the location that the phone was in on that particular date and time. So the court understands the testimony to be that the forensic download will show a date and then perhaps longitude, latitude at a certain time. But it won't say the phone was on Albany Avenue. Is that correct, sir? That's correct. 
So how do, you, how do you determine where the phone is at that point? By either inputting the lat and long into a mapping software, but Celebrite also gives you the option that you can also see that. They pre-map it for you. So you can actually see on another screen the location. And um, based on your observations of the latitude and longitude showing the phone near Albany Avenue, did you um, alert any other law enforcement personnel to that information? Yes, I had, um, I had reached out to the um, detectives that were back at New Canaan Police Department and, uh, and elsewhere of the, uh, of the finding. May I just have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. I have nothing additional. So I take it, I'm not going to ask you a lot about that, I take it you are not an expert then in either of the Cellbrite input or reading the data in its raw form, correct? So I, I am a, uh, I do have training and certifications in Cellbrite, Cellbrite Certified Operator and Cellbrite um, Physical um, Analyzer. Mm -hmm. um, did you have that in 2019? I did, yes. All right, but you didn't want to do this yourself? Uh, at that time, I did not have the experience. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. In 2019, you did not have Correct. the experience. I, I started uh, with the um, Technical Investigations Unit in 2018. You started in 2018, but this happened in 2019. Are you saying, though, you did not yet have sufficient experience Correct. to be able to interpret it, right? Correct. So it's more like if, I, if somebody prints something out, I could look at some data and then try and uh, follow the instructions and punch it in and come up with some <coughs> locations, basically, right? You're not coming up with the locations. The, the software does the that. The software does that. OK, fair enough. So let me move away from that for a moment. I'm going to ask you about your earlier testimony. You said you went to Waveney Park. Is that right? On uh, the, Lapham Road near Waveney Park. On Lapham, Ro on Lapham Road adjacent <laughs> to Waveney Park, correct? correct? And you said something about seeing Officer Blank there, right? Yes. And you also said you observed a um, canine uh, dog, police dog, in the area of that I car. I did not observe the dog. You did not. Then you just heard about it? I was informed that there had been a dog there, yes. Oh, so were you also informed that there were other canine dogs that had been dispatched from state police or from other police departments to also search? Correct. So you were, and so as the, at that time, the chief investigator on this investigation, you're aware that Officer Blank then went into the woods with one of those canine units, correct? Correct. You know that they followed a scent to the Talmadge Hill Metro North Station, correct? Correct. And that's where they lost the, the scent, right? Correct. You testified that um, the, either late on the night of May 24th or early in the morning of the May 25th that Mr. Dulos had a telephone conversation with um, uh, Sergeant Ferenga. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Now, he's no longer, he's higher up now than a sergeant, correct. right? But at the time, he was a sergeant. At the time, he right? was a sergeant, correct. A uniformed officer? He was in the detective bureau. He was in the detective bureau at the time. Correct. And he received a call from Fotis Dulos. Is that right? He had made the phone call to Fotis. He made the call. Correct. And he spoke to Mr. Dulos for some time that night, didn't he? I don't know how long, but he did speak with Mr. Dulos. Yes. And earlier than that, Mr. Dulos had actually called the New Canaan Police Department and spoke to dispatcher that was Officer Coughlin, correct? That's correct. And that was shortly after, as I understand it, a Farmington police officer had notified him that his wife was missing, right? Correct. And that conversation went on for a little bit of time, didn't, didn't it? I wasn't there. I don't know how long that was. Again, you were informed of that by, who was it, Officer Coughlin? Yes. And you were also informed about the longer conversation that Mr. Dulos had with Sergeant Ferenga, right? Yes, I don't know how long the conversation was, but yes. But you were made aware of it that night, is that correct? correct? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is that a yes? Yes. No further questions. Thank you. Is there redirect? No, Judge. Thank you. Detective, you may step down. Thank you. Thank you. Well, 
makes sense to conclude today's proceedings. Attorney Manning, Attorney McGinnis, do you have your, the court is not asking who, but do you have your lineup ready for tomorrow? Yes, Judge. Could, could we have a quick sidebar about scheduling? Right. Well, the court remembers what we discussed, so. Yeah. I want to make sure that was so the jury was aware. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll inform the jury tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's proceeding. We thank you for your attention. Uh, we ask that you uh, be ready tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Please do not discuss the case.